not necessarily permanent employees or seasonal employees or probationary employees or whatever label, and then there may come a time based upon their effort who they know what their cloud is and so on, and they would get a permanent job. In this case, I know there's some people that are pretty tired. <laughs> um, in any event, Mr. Mazurkowitz, despite not having achieved what would be called a, an ideal result, went to his uh, doctor, Dr. Holmes, said, Doc, I got this chance to get this permanent job. It will be beneficial to my family, and I want to go back to work. And Dr. Holmes accommodated him and allowed him to go back to work, despite the fact that he wanted him to get what, what's called a cryo probe, freezing of the nerves. Anybody that's not run into that. So he goes on his merry way, but unfortunately, despite the, the efficacy of the cryo probe, the fact that he's working continues to uh, be a catalyst for his pain phenomenon, bordering on CRPS. Uh, and those kinds of issues, you know, the bane of many, many of our clients and sometimes their lawyers. Uh, so we then started down the road of uh, depositions. Dr. Conowitz was the IME doctor. Uh, Dr. Conowitz indicated that he didn't need any treatment. Lyrica was at best the, the modality that would be appropriate. And he certainly could do everything that uh, any other human being could do without this injury. Uh, Dr. Bubenendra's deposition was scheduled. We went back and forth. My opponent and I selected an agreed date, uh, given schedules of business attorneys. And we finally settled on a date. You know, the money is sent, schedule is there. We'll see you at 1 30 at uh, lunch. And then on the morning of the deposition, I get an email or a fax, quite candidly, I, I can't recall at this very moment. Uh, essentially tell me I, I'm not going to the uh, I'm not going to the depth I'm not going to attend you didn't send me the uh, records uh, of the treating doctor which you are required to do and as a consequence of your uh, inability to conform with the statute I'm not attending I then sent a, a response back saying look we got an agreement we've taken the depths uh, it's all set I mean it's going to be a hardship I'm going to take the deposition so my hope was that my opponent would show up and we would get through this and eliminate this problem. Uh, long story short, we ta I take the deposition. My opponent never shows up. Dr. Bubenendrum amazingly testified in a very clear uh, and meaningful way. He knows his stuff. And uh, <clears throat> we amend ourselves to uh, the arbitrator several weeks later for trial. And you know, what are the quirks in this practice, and we've all encountered it, those of us who represent injured workers, and on the defense side, even if it's been on the way. You know, I use this phrase in the appellate court, and that is that the death penalty gets imposed on these workers much too frequently. And by that I mean death penalty, meaning cutting off the benefits. You know, you look at, a, you look at the background, and I, I would assume that there's some level of backstory gathering by that I mean, you look at the who's, the who's the petitioner. Is he Joe Blow who's always late and he's a problem and he's written up all the time? Or is it a guy who's worked diligently, never missed a day, never refused overtime, has two kids, has a wife, relies on this to keep his head above water and chase the American dream? And what happens with the function of a pen, with the idea of spurning it in somebody's mind? Let's cut him off. So that's what happened in this case. We tried a case, we tried it in front of a, a, an arbitrator who's been around a long, long time, and when I offered the deposition transcript, there was an objection made based upon several grounds, and it's covered in the materials, because the arbitrator, in his decision, went on to great lengths to share the fact that he was very disturbed by the conduct of my opponent in canceling the, the deposition at such a late date. So, we win that case, they review it, commission affirms, commission again, goes through great lengths to explain what they're relying on and so on. And of course, you can imagine that the bone of contention would be, hey, it's an ex party debt that should be barred, we, we shouldn't be using it, relying on it. And if you listen to the oral arguments, you'll hear one of the justices who says, well, wait a minute, the commission didn't just rely on this deposition. I mean, look at their decision. They said that they rely on this medical, this medical, you know, the whole raft and panoply of documentation with regard to the treatment, the condition, the symptoms, and so on. So the whole crux of the argument in the appellate court was whether or not 
the commission committed reversible error, reversible error, because they allowed me to offer, and the arbitrator admitted, a ex parte deposition. And it's interesting, uh, and I had to go back and listen to it because I had told me, boy, that was a heck of an argument. Were you in the room? No, I listened to it on the audio. I don't know if you are aware of that, but you can listen to oral arguments on the internet. Us old guys are adroit enough to figure that out. Anyway, um, the, the, uh, the, the justices were a little ticked off about this. They were a little uh, taken aback that there would be a situation when we don't have a debt, where there is an agreement with the parties, and then the rug is pulled out so short before the, uh, uh, the argument, or, or the, the deposition. And what was curious to me was, or what was interesting to me rather, is the fact, and again, I, I invite you to listen to it, not to hear me talking, but my opponent and then the back and forth with the justice, where they, they talked almost like, you know, former practitioners saying, wait a minute, you can't do this. If you wait till the last minute, you could have chaos. So the bottom line was, they affirmed the decision. Uh, it was a Rule 23. I uh, filed a uh, petition to have it published, and it was denied. So that's the sum and substance. The takeaway, I believe, from this case is this. If you're going to agree to take a deposition, then you're stepping on very thin ice if all of a sudden you decide, no, I'm not going to take that. I'm not going to, uh, to engage in that activity. Uh, you know, I've got an objection or whatever. It's always better to attend a deposition if you've got some viable um, objections, make them on the record, and then deal with it at the time of the hearing. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Yes, sir. How did you memorialize the stipulation to take the deposition of your opponent? Did you send a letter to your opponent? This shall confirm that we agree to take the deposition of Dr. Convention at this date this time. Interestingly enough, my opponent did not did not suggest that you know she wasn't aware of it or there was an error on, on the no, she admitted, yeah, I had agreed, but he didn't send me the last three visits, and uh, based upon that I withdrew my uh, approval. Yeah, it was at 10 o'clock in the morning for a 1 o'clock death, yeah, but it doesn't matter because there's nothing in the statute, nothing in the rules, nothing anywhere that says I can't do that. Uh, in fact, if one of the justices says, well, wait a minute, you're suggesting Mr. Lex is there, the doctor's there, court reporter's there, and then you get to tell him right then before he takes the oath that you're withdrawing your, they weren't too happy. Did your opponent ever make a demand for the records? There, there, was, there was always a question, see, and this was what was curious, in, in, in the appellate court as well as at the circuit court, the last three visits were simply mirrors or, or repetitions of two earlier visits because the doctor had prescribed a certain protocol and it wasn't done, so just a periodic follow-up. Well, until we get authorization for this, etc. Uh, in court, uh, I can't remember the justice's name off the top of my head, he sits between uh, uh, Holrich and uh, Justice Hoffman, but he even said, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I mean, how do you, did you make an effort, did you introduce where you had tried to, to, to subpoena the doctor's records, you know, show us, the, was there anything in the record? And there wasn't. So the opponent didn't offer any real argument about the fact that there was an agreement to take this step. Chris? Do you think if uh, there was an emergency situation, if your opponent had said, you know, my wife's in the hospital and my husband's in the hospital, that would have been looked upon a lot differently if there had been an emergency. The if, that person, were, if that would have happened, I wouldn't have taken it. I figured not. Even you, Rich, wouldn't. I mean, I, think, <laughs> I, mean, I am full-hearted. I do have that. I even have a doctor's note that says I'm full-hearted. Yes, sir. I take it this was a situation where a lot of times, you know, we've all had to cancel deaths and go, okay, I'll call the doc and see if he'll refund or he'll reschedule. Was this a situation where the doc said, well, yeah, reschedule, but send, send me another thousand dollars or two thousand no 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 this was a situation where my client was starving to death his young children were not eating regularly okay. and they weren't paying their mortgage sure. and almost lost their house gotcha that's what that's why didn't you just fax them the, the huh. records that morning i think you're fine why didn't you just fax them the records that morning wouldn't that I mean, I have to. 
wouldn't that have avoided? Why do I have to? I'm just, you know, you don't have to, but it would have saved a lot of time. Yeah, and but it, it, I know my time is running short. But let me just cover one thing. Everybody in this room, everybody in this room, including Mr. Latrain, <laughs> is aware and is required to follow the law. We don't legislate it, right? We practice under it. And yet we have this nuanced kind of practice that's evolved in my time here. And forgive me for waxing uh, a little goofy here. But let's follow the damn rules. There was never in the, any indication that they didn't have the records. And the man, fact of the matter is we set all the records we had. But if you think that, that you're going to subpoena the records every time they go and it's simply a follow-up, I don't think that that's a practical thing. So the fact of the matter is, I didn't find out about the lack of records until 10 o'clock in the morning. And quite candidly, I'm not of the personality that might to say, well, let me get a messenger and get him over there. Will you please, please reconsider your position? Those of you who know me. Um, <laughs> Position says conditioned upon receiving all the medical records prior to the deposition? No. No. Because that wasn't our agreement. Our agreement was an oral communication back and forth. In fact, the lawyer or her assistant and my assistant communicated the thing about that they given the construct of the choices that the doctor gave us. So it wasn't, I mean, we do it every day, right? You go down April 21st, yeah, I'm going to, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, what do you got? Because the doc step over to us. Let's do it at 2. Okay, let me confirm, I'll get back. And that's, that's what we do. Maria? I don't know the answer to the question. I don't think this case is such black letter law that stands for a definitive proposition to address your issue. I mean, each one is a kind of a you know case by case basis. I think just off the top of my head, we confront you with that situation. I look at the doctor and say, Doc, we got to come back. 
Sometimes these unpublished decisions are deciding really, really important issues for us that, that we face every day. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, Mike, the answer to your question is on this slide what was contained in the record about you know this the, the whether the deposition was canceled or who the, 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 there's a, a sentence in the decision that says what was contained in the record bullet point number two here. Um, here's the rule, so make sure you know what the what the rule um, says before you leave take a deposition or ask your opponent to get an order to take a deposition. Keep in mind that this, uh, as Rich has said, you know, is this black letter law or isn't it? Keep in mind that the uh, standard that the appellate court used to decide this issue was the abuse of discretion standard, right? So what they're saying is it's in the discretion of the commission to decide whether this uh, deposition should have come in or should not have come in. And as we all know, that's a very, very deferential standard. So um, it may be the opposite of black letter law. You know, it's, it's this extremely um, deferential uh, standard. Um, you know, some, some of the questions about uh, who had the medical records or whose responsibility was to get the, the medical records is actually answered in, in this decision. So again, here's an unpublished decision answering the questions that, that we all have. Um, you know, uh, the second bullet point here talks about how the Gear case applies to uh, treating doctors and whether Gear actually applies to treating doctors. And we all know that it really kind of doesn't apply to treating doctors anymore. And this is uh, the appellate court kind of reminding us of that. And then um, lastly, the third bullet point, again, not to criticize okay. any particular lawyer's course of action in a particular case, far be it for me to do that. But um, here's the appellate court telling us that respondents have the ability to get medical records in certain ways uh, under this act. And, and it, apparently, the appellate court takes that responsibility and uh, right that respondents have to get medical records uh, seriously. So um, we're going to skip the prior case for now, not because it's that bad traveling employee decision that I talked about. Um, it's because the lawyers who were supposed to talk about it are not quite here yet. So um, we're going to skip it to the end. If we, if we get to it at the end, then I'll just quickly summarize it. I want to uh, get very quickly to the Shawarco um, uh, case. Um, uh, John Bowman and Jim Keenan are both here uh, on the case to, to present uh, the case. This is the case that uh, I talked to you about that besides the relationship between a voluntary uh, resignation or retirement and uh, TTD. So um, I think maybe the best way to do this is to bring up John first, okay, and have John talk a little bit about uh, the case, and then Jim will come up after that and give a few comments and we'll have questions about the case, okay? And again, that's not going to advance these slides just like that. Sure, he wants to start with the loser. <laughs> I think I was skewered by the fickle fate of manifest weight. Uh, arbitrator Kelmanson, I thought, made a very uh, sound decision, factually and legally. Uh, she awarded PPD benefits from the date of Mr. Schwartz's first surgery, which was August 21st, 2006, through March 31st, 2010, which was the date that Dr. Conowitz said he had reached maximum medical improvement. Uh, Conowitz worked for the village of Oak Lawn for 34 years. On April the 6th, 2006, he bumped his right elbow uh, while working on a water meter, uh, had conservative treatment for months, physical therapy, was working light duty, which the village accommodated. Uh, he wasn't getting any better. They finally performed an EMG and it showed significant ulnar nerve damage. Surgery was recommended and the surgery was performed on August 21st, 2006. Uh, a few weeks after the surgery, the village of Oak Lawn approached Mr. Schwarko and about 20 other longtime employees of the village of Oak Lawn and offered a, an early retirement uh, package. Uh, 
Uh, ordinarily, you had to have 30 years of service and be age 55. Uh, Schwarko had 34 years of service, but he was 53. So they put together some vehicle that allowed him to use sick days and, uh, and uh, vacation days and buy two years uh, of age, I guess, to make him 55. So uh, while he was still off recovering from the surgery, receiving TTD benefits, he agreed to accept this uh, retirement, which obviously was an ERISA uh, after retirement, and it was to be effective November 1st, 2006. He was paid TTD up until uh, October 31st, and TTD was terminated effective the date of the retirement, even though he had not been released to uh, go back to uh, regular duty work. And it was also necessary for him to have uh, ongoing treatment, a second surgery uh, in, I believe, May of 2007, uh, referral to Dr. Conowitz, uh, pain management, numerous injections, and, and virtually ongoing treatment for three or four years. Uh, as I said, Arbitrary Cummins had awarded, I think, 188 uh, weeks and, and two sevenths of TTD. Uh, both sides, uh, oh, excuse me, and Arbitrary Cummins had also awarded 80% permanent disability to the right arm. Uh, I thought all along it should have been a total permanent. So both Mr. Egan and myself filed uh, petitions for review before the commission. Uh, I did something that in 39 or 40 years of practice I had not done, I really hadn't seen it done. Uh, I came up with five questions uh, that I presented to the commission a few days before the oral argument, uh, wanting specific answers to these questions. In the commission's decision, they said I didn't give the respondent proper time to respond, although there is no requirement that they respond. This is directed to the commission to answer these questions after, uh, along with their oral argument decision. So they did uh, nothing in that regard. Uh, obviously, we went to, through the circuit court. Well, back up a little bit. The commission uh, gutted the award of TTD. They reduced it from 188 and three seventh weeks to 10 and two seventh weeks, which was a period from the August 21st, 2006 surgery through October 31st, 2006, the day before he retired. Uh, we took an appeal to the circuit court, which was rubber stamped as usual, and then the appeal to the uh, appellate court went on. Uh, I knew obviously it was, it was manifest weight, but I thought uh, that there was enough ammunition that I had a chance to get it overturned. Uh, as usual, I was wrong. The <laughs> appellate court uh, seemed to gloss over the doctor's depositions and the fact that I had hired a vocational rehabilitation expert who testified that this man was then 59 years old, a high school graduate, no transferable skills, <coughs> basically a, a one-armed worker, uh, no computer skills, and stated that considering everything, there was no work that he could do on a, on a regular basis to uh, justify payment to him of wages. The appellate court, and I, I kind of got the impression right away from the question that Justice uh, Hoffman was asking uh, that his mind was made up, and to read the opinion, it, it was, uh, they just basically used manifest weight and uh, affirmed the decision of the commission. Thank you. Um, regarding the five questions, the, the, the public court didn't think uh, I had the right to object to the five questions. They also didn't think that the, uh, not that the commission's not answering them to the the case. In fact, they answered a few of the issues in their decision. Uh, on the odd lot per total issue, um, where it's respect to John, uh, in the deposition in question, the doctor in question was Jeff Cole. was the only person that said this guy could never work again. Uh, every other doctor said he could have worked some form of uh, one-handed duty. And in fact, uh, Mr. Uh, Schwarzer even admitted that both duty work, one-handed work is not available at the world he could have uh, worked with. Um, but I think 
that's why they came down uh, on the online uh, from total issues. Regarding the voluntary retirement, unlike Rich's case, he wasn't starving, was he? He actually moved, sold his place, and moved two and a half hours away. Um, he was never not earning money. In fact, he was earning the same money he would have been earning had he been working. Had they awarded the TTD, he would have owed me money, my client money back. Uh, they really didn't discuss that. Um, we offered work um, in retrospect and credible and helpful. We had a letter in the file that said that we were offering the work, but we had a credible witness that was there uh, that along with the doctor that said the gentleman couldn't work. Uh, the commission and, and the court uh, agreed that it was not against the manifest weight. And um, I think it's a pretty narrow case, really. Um, I think that's a perfect storm with a lot of facts that were in my favor uh, with the doctor's reports and the, and the way it all broke, broke out. But um, I think that's that. Did you offer or doctor retire, uh, tell them not to. Uh, <laughs> they're better off, like interstate, being fired for cause, raping the boss's daughter or something, uh, than going out on a, an ERISA back 34 year earned retirement. <laughs> Or after the commission decides to close the TV. 
No, it was, it was, it, it was, I mean, he had moved to his country, he was under my own the evaluation was done anyway. Yeah, I was just going to say, Larry sets up, I mean, I would be, uh, if John was high or wind of this, I would have to drive the tire here. Yeah. Well, just look at it. You follow it. Any other questions? Yeah. So, uh, regarding this case, um, just to sum up, I, I think most of our speakers have agreed this is a manifest weight case, right? So, so, uh, so of course, you know, facts are very important in a manifest weight case. So, a little change in the facts, one way or another, uh, might have changed this. I don't, I don't think anybody uh, reads this as some type of bright line, you know, per se test that if a, a petitioner has resigned or uh, retired, that they are automatically not entitled to TPD after, after that. So in fact, in manifest rate cases, facts are extremely important. So uh, make sure you know the facts of this case so you understand how to distinguish yourself from the facts of this case or follow the, the facts of this case if you're so fine, okay? All right, any other questions about this one? All right. Um, okay, hold on a second. Yes. I kind of lost. So you voluntarily retired, but at the time of voluntary retirement, the staff restrictions and the employer cannot accommodate the restrictions, nor do they offer to work, yet the period of TP terminates at the time of retirement? No. It's working. So this guy, yeah. yeah. so were they accommodating the restrictions yes. up to the day of retirement? Yes. Yeah. They, 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 he was off work at the time. Of the, they accommodated the restrictions until he went on. Like, he underwent a surgery. And then he opted for the early retirement. When was the surgery in relation to the retirement? Surgery was in late August, early September, something like that. The retirement was late August, the retirement was offered at the beginning of September, <coughs> and it took effect in the next year. So he's off of work for two weeks from surgery. Yeah. Then he retires. Not in the mind that from the surgery, and it, but the period of two weeks terminates. So, how do you not? So, the, the question might become how do you not fall into interstate scaffolding under, well, I mean, under those that. circumstances? And this is this is how the court distinguished interstate scaffolding in this case. It said, you know, we, we pointed out these three exceptions uh, in interstate scaffolding when um, maybe it's not the determinative question about whether you have reached MMI yet. Maybe there are some other questions that need to be asked. And one of the third question is whether you refuse work uh, within the physical restrictions uh, that's prescribed, that are prescribed by the doctor. So that's how the appellate court in this case distinguished the, this particular situation from interstate scaffolding, saying that it fell under this third exception. The, the court looked at the, the testimony of the witness from the court to accommodate other people who had this kind of work. We were accommodating this guy, would have accommodated this guy. Uh, and the fact that they, uh, I mean, this is the voluntary retirement, and these facts essentially were refusal to accept modified duty. That that's it's that could be offered. That's what I was. That's what I was arguing. Could be offered. Yeah, that's the thing. Could be offered. Yeah, that's what I was arguing. That it was tantamount to just saying I'm done. And, and, and I thought the, it was a bigger deal, and just as big of a deal that the guy moved two and a half hours away. And, I, and unless I'm misreading this, pretty clearly that's what the appellate court said. The appellate court says it falls into this third exception number three of interstate scaffolding, and therefore it's not the only, the only, you know, it's not the only question that you have to ask yourself with whether the petitioner is reached MMI. You have to ask yourself if you refuse, you know, uh, refuse work to fall into the physical restrictions prescribed by the doctor. So, that's also a bit confusing because he's sitting on the left side of the pedestal. You've got to get a full run. I'm not sure I understand what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, so we're going to get around to the good, uh, tra the good traveling employee case, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we have Jensen uh, here to talk to us about that case. Thank you, the associated with the uh, good traveling employee case, as opposed to the bad one. Uh, Thomas, he was a city of Chicago plumbing inspector. He did not have a central work site. He would check in and either
while working one day he tripped on a curb. Uh, the curb is not protected in any way. Um, he testified at one point he believed it might have been slightly raised. He testified at another point he believed it. Uh, uh, the city of Chicago, I don't think this is actually in the decision, the city of Chicago paid TTD and medical benefits and only at trial for permanency disputed that it was compensable case. Arbitrator determined that it was uh, compensable. The uh, commission reversed. Uh, the commission did not address in its decision uh, the traveling employee doctrine uh, directly. Please. They relied on the non traveling employee case, the Caterpillar tractor case, um, where a non traveling employee, while leaving work, tripped on a curb in the parking lot. And that was determined to be not Circuit Court confirmed, appellate court unanimously reversed, finding uh, there was a concession made that he was a traveling employee. Uh, he, uh, appellate court agreed that curbs were a neutral risk, but by virtue of being a traveling employee, he was exposed to that neutral risk quantitatively more so than the general public. He can be exposed to neutral risks either quantitatively or qualitatively differently than traveling employees. In this case, it's a quantitative issue. And by virtue of his status as an inspector, he is encountering these curves more often than members of the general public. So there were no issues um, of reasonableness or foreseeability of the injury. He was a city inspector. He was leaving one job site, going back to his car, traveling to another job site for inspection. And so, for all of those reasons, the appellate court determined there was a case. Dave alluded to the bad traveling employee case of prior. Um, and uh, hearing that and thinking about this case before today, as far as I know, me is at least the third in a row published decision from the appellate court, where they reversed the commission decision, where there was no dispute with traveling employee, they found that the accident arose out of employment. The only so-called bad traveling employee cases that I'm aware of in the recent future are a dispute over whether it's a traveling employee, whether he or she is a traveling employee or not. That, that's how I read prior. Um, and that was certainly the, the issue of Richard Luther. But once there's a determination made that it is a traveling employee, the rest of the arising out of analysis seems to be simple. Unless, obviously, there's more outrageous reasonableness and disability issues, um, the old distinction between problem and future problem. That, that traveling employee distinction, to me, is determined. And, and I don't know that it was made as clear to me as in one of those other cases, Curtis where the, the appellate court more explicitly faulted the commission for not employing a traveling employee analysis. Questions? It was, it was his personal vehicle, it was not his vehicle. So then, if you trip on the curb right outside his house, why was it hard to drive to work? You're right, that, and that's, that's very similar to the malarnet, or however you pronounce it, case. Is if you're a traveling employee, you can't pull the phone, even if it's your own personal vehicle. And just one of the distinction on Caterpillar, he was on for adjacent to the employee premises. So, right. had there been a risk in the middle, it would have been. Right. And that gave you a second track. Right. Other questions? Yeah, I think um, the, the street risk doctrine would subsumed under the traveling employee doctrine. You know, th there certainly are risks that every member of the public encounters: curbs, potholes, uh, traffic, um, and, and under a normal analysis, that would be uh, a neutral risk that would not be compensable. But when you deal with traveling employees, um, you know. Are required to be on the streets more so than uh, a person of the general public. And, and as, as I 
always think about it, you know, I kind of uh, think about your typical office worker. You get out of your car, you get off the train, you go to the office, maybe you leave for lunch, maybe you don't, and then you go home. Traveling employees like me, he's a city inspector, he's in on buildings all day long. That's the quantitative distinction that they vouch for us to draw. Um, so if any of those street risks become a part of the employment, you know, I don't, uh, I think Potenzo gave the case from several years ago where that even included street crime, um, where there was no identification of um, why the person was robbed, but they were required to be out on the street, you know, more so than the general public. Any other questions? I think that I'm ready. Everybody else kind of like, really, this is, this is unfair. <laughs> Tripping on a curb, <laughs> tripping on a curb as a city of Chicago building inspector that the court determined was compensable action. There was never a question in my mind that it, that it was compensable, nor was there a question in the city of finances mind when it paid TV and paid medical. And you know, um, Bridge talked about listening to your arguments for reasons that I haven't figured out yet. Your argument on me has been removed from the court's <laughs> website. But at one point, one of the justices, I think it was Justice Hudson, asked me, well, you were just flabbergasted by this commission decision, weren't you? And my only response could be, frankly, yes. Because there was never a question in my mind that this was compensable. And those of you who, who know me know that I, I typically not speak to those as Well, that's a distinction. In 1945 case, I don't have that answer. Well, I, I think I, I think limited to to the need situation, a non-defective curve is probably not, you know, a non-defective curve is probably not otherwise compensable. Um, a defective curve, you know, there, there's a lot of ingress and egress cases that deal with um, defective routes to and from work. So, so there you go. We're going to find cases compensable that otherwise aren't by just pigeonholing. Well, by virtue of being a traveling employee, and that's the that's the determination from the court and from the legislature that those well, not the employees. Well, the, the legislature has certainly acquiesced in that finding by the court. Well, they're acquiescing a lot. That's, that's their that's their prerogative. Lots of areas. They've certainly refused to acquiesce in a lot of areas that I'd like them to. Um, <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that I, I mean the. the Relative merits of whether traveling employee cases should be treated differently aside, the appellate court has been crystal clear that traveling employee cases will be treated differently. Yeah. What I'm troubled by is if we work on the city of Chicago, we're going to have to look at the city of Chicago. Well, I think that's where the problem is. Well, Caterpillar, the Caterpillar tripped on a non effective curve. Well, because, I mean, 
expert testimony. I didn't know that it's all that different from, you know, activation of exposure to certain industries that are, you know, presumed to be exposed to the exposure of exposure. You are, you are put out there more frequently than you are. Well, it's common. I'm the one that, I don't want to feel like a hack coach. It's just that in the summertime, if you're exposed to summertime, you're going to, this is not, exposed to a non-defective curve. That's what you need. You need somebody to testify to that. Who's going to put somebody out there who's going to write a report that? But I would have to testify to that. Because I think that's the way to be. Because then what's the entire court going to say? There's no appetite. They can't do judicial notice when there's expert testimony in the past. Right. Right. So, this is a truck driver for Katzen's. And what he did was he, he would leave his house, he would drive to the Belvedere uh, Depot, he would pick up his truck at the Belvedere uh, Depot and spend a few days on the road um, uh, you know, doing his job as a truck driver uh, for Cassin. So uh, on this particular day, he leaves um, his house uh, with his suitcase as he's putting his suitcase into his own personal vehicle to drive to that depot in Belvedere, um, he uh, hurts his back. Uh, so the question becomes whether that's a compensable uh, incident and ultimately the appellate court um, confirming uh, or affirming not only the arbitrator but also the commission decides uh, that it, under those particular circumstances, uh, Mr. Uh, Pryor was not in fact a traveling employee at the time that he had left um, his house. Um, he uh, may have become a traveling employee at some point later once he reached the depot, but as he leaves his house on that day, he is not a traveling employee. Um, the appellate court distinguishes uh, this case from another case that we talked about about a year or so ago, this case called Milton Archick, where if you remember, uh, Ms. Milton Archick was a, a cleaning person um, who took her lunch break and on her way uh, back to the van that she traveled around to these different sites that she cleaned, she slipped in her own uh, driveway and injured herself. In that case, the appellate court found that that hours. was, in fact, compensable. Um, and here's the appellate court now distinguishing prior from Millen Archick. Uh, in Millen Archick, um, she would travel to different sites to do the cleaning. Um, Mr. Pryor only ever traveled to one site, the depot uh, in Belvedere, to pick up his truck to do of his rounds, and that was the distinction for the appellate court here. He was not a traveling employee because he didn't drive to different depots, he always drove to that one depot uh, to pick up his truck. So Dennis is absolutely right. The, this case hinges on the fact that he was not yet a traveling employee at the time that he was loading his personal suitcase um, into his personal vehicle, unlike Miss Millen Archick, who was a traveling employee when she slipped um, in the driveway um, at the home. And, uh, I think that's it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody.